could not gather here this morning without the keen knowledge that our world is in crisis. Our nation is at the tipping point. Every seven to 10 days, we're no longer shocked, but we expect to hear that lives have been senselessly lost as terrorists ply their wicked activity. The challenges are before us now as they've never been in the past. It is the job of the thoughtful pulpit and the conscientious pew to take a serious look at where we are. One preacher of another generation advised those who stand to preach to preach with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. That makes a lot of sense. Because to be sure, one speaks to the other and one addresses the other. And just in case someone thought that we had already been shocked and disturbed by bad news. I was informed just this morning, as a matter of fact, just a few moments ago, that after the death of Orlando, am I saying that right? Orlando in Baton Rouge, and the death, was it Castile in Minnesota? And then the death of five police officers in Dallas and even more wounded. Well, don't take a breath just yet because just this morning, three police officers were shot in Baton Rouge, and two are dead. Seven shot, and three are dead. The Bible in one hand, and the newspaper in the other. And it is time for us to see what is the key to all of this. Well, if someone were to ask you exactly what is the last book of the Bible all about, what is the book of Revelation all about, I would direct you only to the first verse of the first chapter where it says it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. But follow it on which God gave unto him to show unto his servants, that's us. Listen at this, here's the key, but here's the key to the revelation. It's not just the revelation of Jesus Christ in general, but of things which must shortly come to pass. So the things that are coming to pass have already been talked about. So that we have the unveiling of the person of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, if you want to take it a step further, if someone inquires of you, what is the Bible all about? Then you might want to refer to, once again, to John, who recorded the words of Jesus in chapter 5 and verse 39 of John, when Jesus was in a long, protracted discussion with the Jews, and he sort of excoriated them by saying, you search the scripture, if I can paraphrase, you, you dig into scripture because you think in the scriptures you have eternal life. But he made this statement, they are they which testify of me. So this book, Old and New Testament, testifies, points to, reveals, makes known the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you'll notice also that it's speaking of John 
it says in verse 2, John bear record, he bear record of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Well, that, that to me summarizes the whole ministry and purpose of the church, does it not? Uh, the ministry of preaching, the word of God, God's word, God's word given to us, and the testimony, speaking of, proclaiming, heralding, announcing, presenting Jesus Christ. That's it, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. But if you move to verse 9, you see something very interesting. He says, I, John, that's what I, our forebears used to call him, I, John, who also, I, I'm your brother and companion in this suffering, in this tribulation, in the kingdom and in the endurance of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos. For the word of God, and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Don't miss that. He says in verse, somebody said of him in verse 2, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. But in verse 9, that's what got him in trouble. Because he's saying, I was on this prison island, just like Napoleon in prison on St. Helena. It was a prison island. It was in the Aegean Sea. Uh, really about 10 miles wide, five miles, 10 by five miles, very small island. It was a prison that the Romans would send those to who were political prisoners. So if they decided not to kill you, they would send you to Patmos in the Aegean Sea, which was a body of water between Asia and Greece. Scholars tell us that very likely Emperor Domitian sent John there in A.D. 95. A prisoner for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now I find that fascinating because ask the average person today and they would tell you this is a sweet message. This is a, a good message. It's a positive message. It's, a, it's an engaging message. It's a winsome message. But the truth of the matter is those who stayed faithful to the word of God got in trouble. Don't you find it strange that many of the prophets who preached the word of God were put to death? For this word, isn't it engaging that all of Jesus' disciples but one died a martyr's death for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And I add this, if this message is so appealing and so wonderfully received, why is it that the one that you follow for this message got nailed to a cross? So that the center of our faith is not something beautiful and pleasant, but what do you find on the average church? What do you find around my neck? Of course, what's embroidered on my robe? The most horrendous symbol of death because that's what happens if you preach this gospel. Let me just pause for a moment and say that uh, there, was a, there was a young man, a little child, and his father took him to church. And, and he saw a crucifix. He'd never seen one before. And in horror, he said, Daddy, what's that? What's that? And Father said, that's, that's Jesus Christ. What happened to him? He says, well, son, he, he had a message that the world could not accept. He had a way of life the world could not accept. And they killed him. So as they walked through the church, there was a portrait of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., and the young man said, Daddy, who is that? He said, that's Dr. King. He said, tell me about it. He said, well, he, he had a message like Jesus that the world could not really receive. It was disturbing, it was unsettling. The little boy said, did they kill him too? When you really stand for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, somebody's going to get upset. And if you want to upset people, don't talk about God. Don't talk about religion. Talk about Jesus. 
people will let you talk about anything in the world and they feel comfortable talking about any subject under heaven. But when you say Jesus, go to a, an ecumenical prayer service. And, and they don't mind the way the rabbi prays. They don't mind the way the Muslim play the, uh, honoring Allah, the most magnificent and beneficent. They don't mind the way the sheik prays. But when you say Jesus, then they want to have a discussion. His name causes division. His name causes disturbance. His name makes people uneasy. And that's why I'm going to stick with it. It's the name Jesus that saves. It's the name Jesus that redeems. And it's the only name that's going to get us out of the mess we're in. And I'm bothered because the church seems to be running away from the only thing that's going to help us. The Bible says there's no other name under heaven whereby men must be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. No man comes to the Father but by me that name of Jesus is disturbing but and, and the tragedy is that seems to be the problem yes I tried last week to tell our young people how to stay alive and I'm going to be involved in other PD I've met with preachers and politicians we're trying to do what we can to ameliorate the situation but folks it's going to take the Lord and it, and it bothers me that the church seems to be ashamed of our message it's going to take more than politics. It's going to take more than marching down the street. It's going to take more than Black Lives Matter. It's going to take more than revolutionaries. It's going to take more than who we put in the White House. We're going to need somebody to get us to Jesus, to break the chain off of our lives and to give us redemption. Somebody say Jesus. We run away of our only hope. And let me just go off script for a moment. There's no sense in us standing up here beating up on gay marriage. Folks just need Jesus. Because let me tell you something. If all the gays stop being gays, and if all the alcoholics stop drinking liquor, and all the drug addicts get off drugs, and all the prisoners get out of jail, they still need to be saved. You're not saved by what you do or don't do. You're saved by the blood of Jesus. What can wash? away my sin nothing but the blood of what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of oh how precious is that flow that makes me white as though no other fount I know nothing but the blood of Jesus my sin Oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole is nailed to his cross. And I bear it no more. This word, John was out on that island because of the testimony of Jesus Christ. But that's all right. Man can only do so much to you. He was out there by himself without his choir without his college, without his deacons, without his congregation, but that's all right. The Bible said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. You see, the good part about that is I don't have to be in church to go to church. I can have church all by myself. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And it does not do us much good to come to church and not be in the spirit. And John said, being in the spirit, I heard some things and I saw some things. Do you know why some people go to church and don't see anything? And don't hear anything, baby, you got to get in the spirit. That doesn't mean how you run around the room or jump over a bitch. It means when you let God's spirit connect with your spirit. It's when you get beyond yourself. It's when you slip out of the temporal and have an encounter with the eternal. I was in the spirit. He said, when I got in the spirit, I was by myself. But I heard some things. I heard them behind me. It was such a commotion. I turned to see and I couldn't believe what I saw. I saw now I knew Jesus. I knew him personally. But when I saw him, never saw him like that. He looked like the son of man. But, but you should have seen him. He had this dazzling garment on. But as I looked in his face, he had, my God, his hair was snow white, like lamb's wool. 
His eyes were like a blaze of fire. I, I, I looked like a sharp two-edged sword was coming out of his mouth and he had a golden sash about his chest. It looked like his feet had been burnished and brown. And when I saw him, I fell as a dead man. But he touched me and said, get up, John. They sent you here to die, but I sent you here to get a revelation. Oh, I just got something from heaven. Well, the devil put you somewhere to die. The devil put you somewhere to wipe you out. The devil thought you was going to get discovered, but he, in the very place he thought was going to take you out, God showed you something. Don't make me preach up in here. The devil meant it for evil, but God said right there. Well, the devil meant to hurt you right there. Well, he meant to take you out. I'm going to bless you. Look at somebody tell him right there, right there, right there. I knew the Lord, but I never, I never saw him like I saw him till they put me on that island. Then he said, uh, then he started talking. I tried to deal with this before. He said, I am Alpha and Omega. I tried to deal with that some weeks ago. That's comprehensive. I'm the first and the last. But whenever you talk about God, Elder Wyatt and I sometimes have this theological coambulation. Let you not have been to school. Uh, we argue that that's not exactly precise language. That's accommodationist dialogue for us to understand because when you say he's the first, he's not just the first, but he's the first before the first. And since we don't know what goes before one, we just have to say first, but he see God is before there was is. God, 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 God was before was was. I'm messing up the language, but before there was a is or was God. He's just God, y'all. And they say he stepped out on nothing. That's not exactly right. Because before God was, wherever he was, even though we might not understand it, he stood in the sanctuary of his own existence. He stood in the temple of his own surroundings. He stood in his own space, whatever that is. From everlasting. Before the before. And after the after. That's what he meant. Then he said, not only am I the first and the last, and the beginning and the ending. And notice, notice the language there, y'all. It didn't say end, it said ending. Now in the Greek, that always means something that's continuous, something that keeps going on. Ah, but then he says, I am the living one. That's important too. The living one. See, see, folks, there are a whole lot of forces and factions and, and faces and politicals and poets and priests and preachers and politicians and kings and rulers and people who think they run in the show. But they can't say I'm the living one. That phrase living one suggests I'm the only one who can speak into time and regulate what goes on. See, we need to tell the world that no matter what happens, this stuff ain't in charge. Only the living one can regulate and speak to what's happening in the historical circumstance. See, that word living one, no one else can say. You, you see, because, because there were some living ones, and pardon my broken language, but they ain't living now. At one time, Pharaoh Amenhotep and Ramses was in Egypt, but they're not there now. Uh, at one time, Alexander the Great ruled Egypt, but Alexander is not answering to his name this morning. At one time, Antiochus Epiphanes ruled Syria. He's not there now. At one time, Julius Caesar, Caesar Augustus, Domitian, Caligula, Nero, 
but they're not there now. At one time, Lenin and Stalin was in Russia, but they're not there now. At one time, uh, Adolf Hitler was in Germany. Benito Mussolini was in Italy, but they're not there now. At one time, Mao Zedong was in China. At one time, FDR and JFK and Johnson and Nixon were in the White House, but they ain't there now. But I know somebody was there then, is there now, and will be there tomorrow. You don't hear me, do you? And the reason he said, because I am he that was dead, but I'm alive forevermore. See, I'm the only one that went in the grave and came out of the grave with victory over the grave. Oh, I know that Lazarus got up, but Lazarus is dead this morning. But I went in the grave, took the sting out of death and the victory out of the grave and made the grave my servant. I am he. I was dead. I was shown up dead. For three days, I was dead. My body was dead, but while my body was dead, I went down the back streets of the, of the grave and preached a three-day revival in hell. And when I got up, the saints got up with me. I, I got up a conqueror over death, hell, and the grave. I am he that was dead, but I'm alive forevermore. And that's why I have hope today. That's why I can't get too upset, because I know the living one. I know the one that's controlling everything. And then he says, and then he says, I have the keys. Interesting word. I have the keys. Hate to lose my keys. I have the keys. But look at what he says. To death and Hades. Now, this is where we are, folks. We're in a crisis right now. Um, the other night, where was it? In Nice, France. How many killed? 80 plus. Death. And then in Turkey, they tried a coup. How many killed? Bunch of them. And then in Brussels and Orlando. And it seems like these forces are in charge. But the Bible says, I've got the keys. Not only to death, but to Hades. That's the Greek word Hades that comes from that Hebrew word Sheol, which simply means the place of departed spirits. Sometimes it means the departed spirits, and sometimes it means the evil departed spirits, but you did, you did. So many, the King James just says hell, but it ought not be translated hell because you get the place of burning. No, it just means the place of departed spirits. But isn't it interesting that Jesus said, I have the key to death and Hades. So that, don't you find it interesting that, that I not only control this world, I control the other world. I not only control what happens here, but I open the door and close the door even to the other world. That's why I can't let ISIS upset me. I know who has the keys. I can't let aberrant police officers scare me. I know who has the keys. And I'm not gonna ride around being scared I'm going where I want to go. I'll sit up in a restaurant. I'll go to the movies. I'll go to because I know who has the keys. I know who's holding my life in the palm of his hand. I know who's got the authority to make death behave. I know who's standing between me. He that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber. The Lord is my keeper. The Lord is the shade upon my right hand. The sun won't smite me by day, nor the moon by night. A thousand will fall at my side. 10,000 at my left hand, but it won't come nigh me all night, all day. Angels, watch 
watching over me. I know who has the key. I know who holds my hand. He walks. He walks with me. He talks with me. He tells me I am his own. I didn't mean to go this far. The joy. Don't push me like center. The joy that we share. He is my protection. He is my God. He is my guide. He is my strength. He controls history. He controls France. He controls America. He controls Baton Rouge. He controls Marrero. He controls the Ninth Ward. He controls Kenham. He controls DC. He controls Hillary. He controls Trump. He controls the Democrats and the Republicans. He has risen from the dead and he is Lord. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. Hug somebody. Tell them be not dismayed. Whatever be tied, he's got the keys. He will take care of you. He will take care of your child. He will watch over you. He will see you through. Guess what, y'all? Guess what, y'all? And I'm done when I tell you this. I'm done when I tell you this. If you don't have the key, you can't get in my office. If you don't have the key, you can't get in my house. If you don't have the key, you can't start my car. Now we pass out some keys around here. So you can get in the front door or another door. But only a few of us have what's called a master key. I have a key that can open any door in this building. I know somebody that has the key to everything I need. He has the key to your joy. He has the key to your peace. He has the key to your deliverance. He has the key to your blessing. He has the key to your protection. He has the key to your money. He has the key to your marriage. He's got the key. Oh, he's got the key. He can open a door. No man can shut. He can shut a door. No man can open. Ain't you glad? Ain't you glad? He's got the key. Don't make me holler. He's got the key. Holler from. I say he has the keys. Tell the Democrats. Tell the Republicans, tell the police, tell the young men, you don't have to die. I've come that you might have life and that more abundantly.